From approximately 10,000 to 14,000 BC, there lived a nomadic people in the southwest of what is now the United States who struggled for their very existence. They found shelter in caves, primitive dwellings, or tents. They ate the animals that prowled the countryside, ancient bison, mammoths, mastodons, giant sloths, and tapirs. It must have taken a lot of courage to confront a mastodon or a mammoth, even in large groups of fierce and experienced hunters. Some researchers suggest that the most menacing animals were not part of the regular diet. Rather, hunting them was a ritual of machismo. They actually survived on smaller animals, such as deer, hare, bison, and prairie dogs, as well as edible plants. They were not without resources, but had developed one of the very first inventions in North America, a lance thrower called an atlatl, which propelled a sphere topped with a sharp, double-faced stone head. The atlatl provided added thrust and allowed the hunters to remain a good distance from their ferocious prey. The fossils of these ancient people tell a story of hardship and violence. Lost limbs, deep, partially healed wounds, broken bones, atlatl heads embedded in their backs or hips, and skull fractures reveal the difficulties of daily life. Did they love? Did they enjoy life? Did they laugh? Did they tell jokes? It is impossible to recapture the details of their undoubtedly difficult lives with the limited data available. But we can guess that they were under constant stress. Staying alive and safe from moment to moment was their chief preoccupation. They might rise in the morning staring into the eyes of a mammoth or a mastodon, Happiness was probably an emotion seldom felt, while fear was a constant plague. These people were called the Clovis and are the ancestors of 80% of the indigenous people of North and South America. About 9,000 years ago, the Clovis culture disappeared. Over time, the climate changed radically. Many of the huge animals hunted by the Clovis became extinct. As they adapted to new conditions, they gradually transformed into a group called the Anasazi, the ancestors of the Pueblo peoples of today. The nomadic life was a hard one. Dry plateaus, high rugged mountains, and deep canyons did not provide a perfect environment for farming. But the inhabitants became tired of wandering. They started to settle down and raise hardy plants that could withstand difficult desert weather. The melting snow in the spring formed small streams, enough water to irrigate wild flowers and weeds. Little by little, these early people began to grow a crop that has remained a staple to this day, corn. Early people found a number of ways to store water from the limited springs in the valley. They built small dams and catch basins to redirect water into their fields. It is believed that the water table may have been closer to the surface than it is today, and so they may have successfully dug wells. When it did rain, they captured the flow in ditches, much like irrigation canals, and closed both ends, only raising them to water their crops. They continued to gather wild plants such as beeweed, rice grass, pinon nuts, and cactus fruits. But now they added corn, beans, gourds, and squash to their diet. They hunted small and medium-sized wild animals, such as rabbits, bison, prairie dogs, elk, antelope, and deer. They cultivated turkeys. 
They knew how to sun dry their crops in yucca baskets to save them for winter. At the end of the fifth century, two large pithouse villages with about a hundred structures each were erected in Chaco Canyon in what is now the northwestern part of New Mexico. A pit house is a rounded underground structure with a roof made of brush, thatch, or planks held up by wooden poles. A hole in the roof is used both as an entrance and as an exit for smoke from an indoor fire pit. Dark and airless pit houses served the basic living needs of the people. They were warm in winter and cool in summer. By 750, people started building small, one-story limestone blockhouses, clustered together in communities of 100 or so residents. By the 900s, building techniques improved, and they began to build two-story structures. Often, these communities contained a ceremonial building called a kiva. This was an offshoot of the pit house, a round, underground structure with a rectangular exit in the roof. These kivas served multiple functions. They were used as residences, religious halls, and storage facilities as well. A question any current visitor to Chaco Canyon might ask is, why would anyone want to live here? Its endless miles of moon-like landscape are inhospitable at best. Water was in short supply, while sand and small desert shrubs were everywhere. The distant mountains were wooded at their lower levels, but even the weather was bleak, blazing hot in summer and icy cold in winter. There were many more attractive places to live south of the canyon, places with rivers and abundant vegetation, yet they chose to build in this particular place. Many archaeologists believe that Chaco was chosen for its astrological significance. The Chaco peoples, like the other indigenous cultures, studied the skies closely. They were astrologers who guided their lives by the placement of the moon, the stars, and the planets. They constructed their buildings in sites that would capture the sunlight at significant times of year, such as at the solstices and the equinoxes. To them, Chaco might have been a holy place. As the years passed, the technology of the Chaco people became more advanced. Around 850, they began building much larger structures, great houses. The walls of these large edifices were constructed from stacked sandstone blocks held together by mortar made of mud. Sandstone was plentiful in the area and the Chaco people used thousands of these blocks to create their great houses. In time, the masonry got more refined. Walls became thicker at the bottom and thinner near the top to stabilize the structure. After this alteration, they started filling the center of the walls with rubble, again increasing the stability of the upper levels and allowing the craftsmen to build higher and higher walls that were set sturdily upon the thick structure of the base. Wood was used abundantly to create the great houses. The roofs were held up by pillars of large tree trunks. The roofs themselves were made of tree limbs crisscrossing one another. There were few, if any, trees in Chaco Canyon. Mountains some 50 or 70 miles away were filled with oak, ponderosa pine, pinyon pine, and juniper trees. This distance did not deter the intrepid architect of the Great House projects. They hiked to the forest and brought lumber back to their building sites in the canyon. How did they transport these heavy trees? How did they fell them? They had no power tools, no saws, no metal at all. They had no beasts of burden, no mules, no horses, 
no elephants, no wheels. They had only stone tools and manpower. They had to cut the trees down, remove the branches, section the trunks into appropriate lengths for the beams, cut the branches for the roofs, and haul it all to a site about 70 miles away. It seems like an impossible task, and yet, by the end of the construction period in 1150, they had hauled over 250,000 logs, an average of 70 miles, to build the five-story, 600-room, 27-kiva super great house, Pueblo Bonito. It was not just the largest great house in the Chaco Canyon area, but the largest building in North America until the 19th century. There were over 150 other great houses built in the Chaco region during and even after that period, 13 in Chaco Canyon alone. Can you picture what the canyon looked like during this period? People hauling logs, others returning to the forests and the mountains to get more trees and branches, still others shaping sandstone into appropriate sized pieces, still others hauling earth and sandstone to create a level field on which to place the buildings, or to create the foundation for roads, and still others doing the mundane tasks of cooking and cleaning, lighting fires, farming, hunting, and making pottery. A lot of people worked to get these colossal structures completed. It was an unimaginably huge task. With up to 600 rooms, sandstone walls up to five stories, ceilings held up by wooden beams, you might imagine that thousands of people lived in the great house itself. There is evidence, in fact, that very few actually did and that much of the structure was occupied by the few elite members of the Chaco community. If many people occupied the great house, there would be the remnants of many harvests for cooking. There would be large mounds where they would throw their old pottery or other trash. But in fact, there are few hearths or mounds, but many interior windowless storage rooms. The limited number of elite families who actually lived in the great houses, according to anthropologists, had better health than those residing in the simple dwellings in the canyon. The bodies discovered in the burial chambers of the great houses are more robust than those found in the modest graveyards. Room 33 of Pueblo Bonito was a burial chamber for multiple generations of people related through the women in the family. Archaeologists found many luxury items in the great houses. Jewelry, flutes, effigies with inlaid turquoise, turquoise beads, and cloth with feather decorations. The Chacoan people were small, with an average height of 5 feet 4 inches. Their lifespan was short, 27 years. The lifespan of women was 20 to 25 years. That of men was 31 to 35 years. By 29, a majority of the population suffered from degenerative arthritis, which is still a problem among Native Americans today. Child mortality was high. When drought hit and conditions were poor in the mid-12th century, child mortality could reach 50% or even higher. Only 5 to 10% of the population reached the age of 50, and most of those who did were virtually toothless. Archaeologists believe the loss of teeth was caused by eating cornmeal ground on a stone or matate, which left pebbles that irritated the teeth and gums. There must have been a lot of horrible toothaches among this population. There is evidence that Chaco Canyon was an important regional, cultural, 
commercial and ceremonial center. The Chaco people traded with other groups far and wide. Archaeologists believe that over 17,000 people lived in the nearby Chesca Mountains, the place where much of the timber originated and whose population made much of the pottery used and traded by the Chaco people. Seashells, metal bells, the bodies of macaws along with their feathers, mugs with chocolate remnants, all have been unearthed around the canyon. None of these items were local. All seem to have come from southern Mexico, some 1,500 to 2,000 miles away. Even the turquoise for the thousands of objects found in the canyon originated in the Santa Fe area, 180 miles away. In Pueblo Bonito, researchers found over 15,000 turquoise beads and pendants in a grave site for only two elite persons. Perhaps a large number of storage rooms in the great houses held goods for buying and selling, as well as food which they gathered in good seasons to save for times of scarcity. The Chaco people might have sponsored huge communal gatherings in their plazas and kivas. There were 32 kivas, three extra-large ones, as well as large patios and ceremonial buildings in Chaco Canyon, the largest of which is the Great Kiva near Pueblo Bonito. The kivas were used for ceremonies, religious and public gatherings, burials, storage, and astrology. There, they most likely prayed to their gods for rain, good harvests, health, and plenty of game animals. The design of kivas derived from that of the pit house. They were comprised of one round underground room in which there was a fire pit, a fire deflector, and benches around the perimeter. There was usually a sipapu, a square hole in the roof that symbolically represented the tunnel from which their ancestors had entered the earth from the underworld. There was a square entrance in the roof with a ladder inserted for entering and exiting. Kivas are used ceremonially today by the Pueblo Indians. The symbolism is the same as in ancient times. Those leaving the kivas during these ceremonies represent ancestors entering earth from the underworld. The Chaco people had no written language. They used petroglyphs, pictures etched in rock canyon walls, or pictographs, pictures and murals painted with natural pigments to communicate with one another. Many petroglyphs have survived, as have pictographs that were painted as murals in kivas or rooms. Many, however, have been washed away by time and the elements. For the Chaco people, the petroglyphs might represent real events, memory boosters for songs, stories or ceremonies, or simply an image that moved them to recreate what they saw or imagined. Another amazing feature of Chaco Canyon is the over 200 miles of carefully constructed roads. In the canyon, the roads were 15 feet wide, Outside of it, they were 30 feet wide. The most remarkable feature of these roads is that they were for the most part absolutely straight. Our contemporary highways turn to the left or right as engineers encounter hills or dales. Those of Chaco Canyon did not. When they came upon the side of a cliff, they cut a staircase straight up to the top where the road would continue. If a hill had a gentle grade, they would use stairs or ramps made of earth and masonry. When the road did turn, it was at a sharp angle. The Chaco people had no carriages or beasts of burden. In fact, they had only their feet. So why did they need these wide roads, 
especially when some of these thoroughfares, such as the Great North Road at Pueblo Bonito, ended abruptly in the middle of nowhere. Some anthropologists believe that these roads had more of a religious than a practical purpose, symbolically guiding those coming from the land of the dead to the land of the living. Others believe they served a practical purpose. A smooth surface made it much simpler to transport logs to their building sites or for traders to bring their wares into the town. Despite all of the wonders that the ancient people created in Chaco Canyon, they abandoned it. They left their homes. They left the familiar circumstances that their people had known for three centuries. They simply boarded it all up and took off for other parts. Why did they abandon the canyon? Why did they seal up the entrances and burn down the kivas? Was it climate change? At about 1150, there was a massive drought that lasted for 50 years. Was it environmental degradation? In a location with so little water, they may have pushed farming to the limits. In their passion for building great houses, they might also have denuded the land, cutting tree after tree, not waiting for new ones to regenerate. Did they encounter hostility from outside forces or possibly from civil strife within their own community? Some anthropologists believe that the people living in the great houses got too greedy during difficult times. As long as everyone flourished, people were content and satisfied with their leaders. But when times were tough and the elite were eating and the poor were starving, the workers and farmers might have revolted. At the very least, they might have taken off to a more fruitful environment. With fewer and fewer workers propping up the economy, the elite in the great houses may have decided to leave as well. Whatever the cause, the Chaco people left everything to the wind and the winter snows and to current anthropologists and archaeologists who continue searching for the answers. Where did they all go? It is believed that the majority migrated a hundred miles to the south to another important community, Mesa Verde, with whom the Chaco people were already familiar. From about 1100 to 1300, the people of Mesa Verde constructed dwellings in caves and on the sides of cliffs by carving into the rock and using log beams to hold up the walls and ceilings. More than 600 such units have been discovered. One such edifice, Cliff House, had 150 rooms and was between three and four stories high. There were advantages to such high dwellings, aside from safety from predators and intruders. A dwelling in a cliff overhang made for a fairly cool environment in summer and prevented the worst of the cold winds from penetrating their houses in winter. It required courage and good balance to reach your bed at night using the toeholds hewn into the rock to get there. God help the Mesa Verdeans who had a fear of heights. The Mesa Verde people made advances in water conservation using stone obstructions around their crops to divert the flow of water and to prevent runoff. The walls of their dwellings were made of a soft stone which allowed rain to penetrate and be captured and retained within their rooms. The cliff dwellings often had many rooms, but like those of Chaco Canyon, Many were used mostly for storage. The majority of people lived along the canyon rims in multifamily simple structures. From 1200 to 1250, as many as 30,000 people lived in the Mesa Verde region. But by around 1300, they had all left. For 200 years, they had been busy creating their wonderful dwellings, and then they simply deserted the place. It seemed like many intended to return because they left stored food and pottery. But, in fact, 
they never did come back. From all appearances, they left under much more adverse circumstances than those who had abandoned Chaco Canyon. Skeletal remains tell a story of carnage. There was fighting. Many, many people died of bodily injuries. There is even evidence of cannibalism. Some researchers believe that a great drought drove hunger and malnutrition to new heights and that one clan would attack another for food supplies. Or it might even have happened within a clan. People might have been so desperate that they would attack anyone with resources. Whatever the cause, people left Mesa Verde and never returned. Where did the people from Mesa Verde go? It is believed that they migrated to the Rio Grande area, a place with a robust water source and a friendly clan of people with a similar language to theirs, the Tiwa. Is there any evidence that the Mesa Verdeans migrated to the Rio Grande area? Modern-day Native Americans are very reluctant to allow scientists to test the DNA of their dead ancestors, so anthropologists turn to testing the DNA of dead turkeys. Before 1300, the bones of the turkeys in Mesa Verde and those of the Rio Grande regions were distinctly different from one another. After a large group of people from Mesa Verde disappeared, the DNA of the turkeys in the Rio Grande area gradually became similar to that of the Mesa Verde turkeys. This suggests that the Mesa Verde people joined the Tiwa population and brought their amorous turkeys with them. The architectural style, the pottery style, and the artifacts from Mesa Verde were not reproduced in the Rio Grande area, which has left many anthropologists skeptical that the Mesa Verde people did indeed migrate there. But it is believed that a large part of the population that had inhabited the Mesa Verde region spoke Tiwa and would have felt comfortable joining a Tiwa-speaking group. After the Great Migration, the Pueblo Indians seemed to settle into a comfortable lifestyle in the fertile Rio Grande region. But life has never proved to be easy for the indigenous people of America. The next disaster was just around the corner, and it proved to be the largest catastrophe of all. It is quite amazing how quickly conquistadors started exploiting, robbing, and raping the indigenous people of the Americas so soon after Columbus reported his findings to Europeans in 1492. But despite the brutality of the Spanish, their enslavement of the native peoples, and the diseases that wiped out so many of them, the Pueblo Indians have survived. Today, there are more than 60,000 Pueblo Indians in the Southwest, most of whom live in or near the 32 Pueblos in New Mexico, Arizona, and Texas. They speak one of the six Pueblo languages, jealously guard their customs, and run their own governments. Their culture survives and thrives today because of their fierce commitment to maintaining it despite the horrific headwinds of history.